Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. And welcome to the first in what is going to become a regular series of reports from Mary Batari. And she now joins us from Madison, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Thank you, Paul. Mary is the deputy director of the Center for Media and Democracy, and they publish websites like PRWatch.org and BanksterUSA.org and AlecExposed.org. And she's going to be doing regular reports on all of these themes. Thanks for joining, Mary. So, so what's, what are you following this week, Mary? Well, you know, we're based here in uh, Wisconsin, and we've been closely following the struggle in Michigan over the right to work law uh, that the uh, state legislature just jammed through. Now, I guess uh, it should, more appropriately could be titled the right to work without a union or collective bargaining law, which is more or less what it is. <clears throat> but uh, you, you were telling me before the interview that the legislation changed at the last minute. Yeah, for a long time, Governor Schneider said, I don't want to do right to work. It's too divisive. It's not really our cup of tea here in Michigan. We support workers in Michigan, those kinds of things. Then he threw all of that out the window when he realized that his lame duck legislature was leaving and a new legislature had been elected will probably wouldn't allow him to do right to work. And I hate using the phrase right to work, but we've never come up with a good substitute for it. Um, it is an Orwellian phrase. Uh, lots of people refer to it as the right to work for less law because there, are t there were 23 right to work states. They were mostly in the South. They made it very, di the law makes it very difficult for unions to organize and to exist. So the right to work legislation is sort of a push in the race to the bottom in workers' wages, workers' benefits, uh, and those kinds of things. Well, what I say is it's the right to work without a union, right? That's, that, that, that's true. And it screws around with the financing of unions, and it makes it harder for them uh, to uh, generate revenue to pay for the cost of representation. So anyways, the governor said, I'm not interested in that. He changed his mind last week. Uh, he announced uh, on Thursday that he was going to be going with Right to Work and that, uh, in fact, he was going today with Right to Work. And at that moment, they substituted language into a previously existing bill um, uh, that put in verbatim language from the American Legislative Exchange Council's Right to Work bill. And this ALEC, as is, is, uh, I guess a lot of our viewers know, uh, is this right-wing uh, conservative group that drafts model legislation for states to adopt. And when Republicans can control uh, state legislatures and the governor, they do what they just did in Michigan with the such legislation. That's right. And it's not just legislators. If it was just legislators, we wouldn't maybe worry so much about it. It's legislators and corporations voting behind closed doors on model legislation. And those corporations are some of the largest corporations in the world. Exxon Mobil, Coke Industries, uh, those types of institutions who really benefit if unions aren't around. Uh, and the controversy over ALEC has risen to such an extreme this year that we've convinced 42 corporations, including Walmart, including General Motors, uh, to drop out of ALEC. Uh, and yet, in Michigan, they decided to go in a different direction and polish up the ALEC Right to Work Act and jam it through a lame duck legislature who had been voted out of office. So it was grossly undemocratic, uh, a total affront to working people around the state. Uh, people were very hot under the collar at the protests at the meeting. Um, uh, there was a, 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 a huge amount of upset and it's a major blow to the American labor movement. Now, this is, is this primarily aimed, do you think, at representation in terms of day-to-day -day working conditions and pay and such, or is this more directed at trying to get unions out of the political game? So much union money is going to support Democratic Party candidates and union resources going, to, you know, in terms of knocking on doors and such. Is it more the political side that this is aimed at or not? Um, it's clear when you look at the ALEC Library of Bills, they have about 20 or 30 ways to kneecap and defund and screw around with union financing. Uh, and they have about 20 and 30 other ways to kneecap and defund and screw around with trial lawyers. It is very clear that they're targeting uh, uh, the big backers of the Democratic Party. That is a completely partisan move um, and that uh, it, you know, it hurts. It hits uh, unions where it hurts in the financing end, uh, and they need that money to pay for organizers. They need that money to be a political force in the in the arena 
uh, and to stand up for workers against CEOs and, and big corporate heads like the Koch brothers and their, their anti-worker agenda. Uh, some people have argued that you know, this may have unintended consequences for the conservative backers of this legislation in the sense that it's actually going to force unions now to be a lot more communicative with their members and spend more of their efforts and time on educating their own members because now they're going to have to collect dues voluntarily. And, and that's how it used to be. In fact, in, in the days when unions were far more militant, it was days where they didn't have this kind of checkoff due system. And, and some people have argued, in fact, the checkoff system that, that's in dispute now, where dues are collected through people's pay, actually was part of a co-optation of the unions. It took, it took out some of their verve and drive. Uh, and, and that, un, in terms of unintended consequences, it may push unions back into being more democratic than they were. I, I, don't, I know they use that language, the right wing, that they want transparency and democracy. I think it's the last thing they really want, but they might actually wind up getting it. Well, there's no doubt that um, the union movement as a whole could benefit from more door-to-door -door communication with their members and more education of their members. But what we saw here in Wisconsin after something similar was tried is that the unions on the higher end of the pay scale, and here in Wisconsin that some of the teachers uh, and other unions uh, did sign up to pay their dues. Um, some of the folks on the lower end of the pay scale, the county snowplow drivers, uh, who I so desperately rely on as a Wisconsin commuter, um, found it much harder to pay those union dues when they were struggling with their day-to-day -day bills. So uh, here in Wisconsin, unions are going door-to-door -door more, they're organizing more, but their numbers have taken a really hard hit. Um, up to 40% of teachers, maybe even higher for other public sector workers. But because of this legislation or for, uh, for basic because, cutbacks and such? No, because of what Scott Walker did to collective bargaining. I mean, he gutted the collective bargaining law here in Wisconsin uh, with, only for public workers. Um, Schneider is doing something similar, although different, uh, it, for public sector and private sector workers in Michigan. And, and I, may I just say that we may not be done in Wisconsin. After what we just saw in Michigan, Scott Walker could try the same thing and roll in right to work here in Wisconsin uh, and, and att finally attack the public sector unions. Okay, Mary, anything else th this week on your mind? The other thing that I, I was worried about this week is uh, the Department of Energy put out a report saying uh, that they thought maybe fracking for export was a great idea. They didn't call it fracking for export. They call it natural gas export opportunities. Uh, but it's a big change. You know, 10 years ago, we were talking about importing liquefied natural gas into the United States. Now there's a natural gas boom led mostly by this destructive practice of fracking. And the Department of Energy thinks it's a nice idea to expand those big LNG terminals to frack for foreigners and to export that stuff overseas. Whereas you and I know the climate change activists are telling us that if we continue on this path, um, what needs to happen is not more fracking, not more burning, not more drilling, but uh, that companies need to keep about 80% of their identified reserves in the ground uh, in order to ameliorate the climate change situation. So I was very disappointed to see the Obama administration put out this big report uh, and it is now open for public comment. People can learn more about it on our website, prwatch.org. All right, thanks for joining us, Mary. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Real News Network. Don't forget, we're in our year-end fundraising campaign. Matching funds are available to us up to $150,000. Every dollar you donate by the button over here somewhere will be matched until we hit that target. Thanks again for joining us on the Real News. Mm -hmm.